So right now, I'm going to use some tactical software to kind of like re-examine my thoughts and ideas from last night's game. You know, I have to admit, I got a few things wrong in my match review. I was a bit confused by certain things I saw. I didn't fully explain things, etc, etc. So today, I watched the entirety of last night's game again. And I have to say that things became a lot more clearer afterwards. Uh, you know, normally, when you're watching a game in real time, you know, you're emotionally invested in the game. You know, you're hoping that... Uh, things in the game swing your way, you get some favour and, you, and your team wins. So um, when you watch a game without that emotion, you kind of like see it for what it is and accept it. And I guess that was what I had to do to really understand some of the, a lot of the new things that Graham Porter was introducing. So I guess to start with things, like the first thing that I, I made a mistake on was the formation by calling it like a 4-2-3-1. It was in fact a 3-5-2. I could be more specific, I could say it was more like a 3-5-1-1 style team. Uh, of course, at the back, we had Aspilicueta playing, Silva and Kukurea playing a very interesting role, which I'll get onto as this video does go on. Jorginho was kind of sitting in front of them. Uh, some interesting changes. We saw Reese James playing in his typical wingback role. We saw Raheem Sterling in a starting position as a wingback. And we saw the return of box to box mids in the system with Mateo Kovacic on the left hand side, Mace Mount on the right hand side too, and Kai Havertz playing in behind and off of Aubameyang up front as well too. I think that the first like big difference that we're seeing from Graham Porter compared to Thomas Tuchel is I'd say the, um, the, the central presence now in the team. Before, you didn't really see that under Thomas Tuchel. Uh, he preferred to have a lot of wide overloads on these sides here. You know, you see your mounts there. Uh, you know, you'd see your habits is there, etc, etc. But uh, for me, I like the central presence because this is how you can form and build connections. And I think maybe one thing we have to realise now as fans is that, you know, Graham Porter is a tactician. But he's not like Thomas Tuchel where I felt like Tuchel really had like a very significant imprint in terms of how he wanted his teams to play. It felt like they were following a lot of rules and the moment that the plan wasn't working, we were inviting to just putting in blind crosses and there was no real identity or understanding between the players on the field. So I do think now we're going to have to have some patience now for these guys to fully form and build some understandings because yeah they'll have the the structure and framework that's going to support them but at the same time you know these are guys playing for Chelsea Football Club which means that they're top players and they're good players and they have to be able to express themselves and be able to find the solutions on the field as well too so yesterday's game we saw a lot of uh, final third entries in the books one of the first noticeable things about Graham Potter was how he really spread the back three really wide. I mean, Aspi moved all the way out here. Kukurea moved all the way out here as well too. Alongside Silva with Jorginho dropping deeper, of course, to be that like passing facilitator in those areas. Now, because the uh, wides in the backs were spread really wide, it kind of makes sense why like box to box mids are needed. And maybe this will be like a blessing for like your mounts and others. Uh, for example, because the distances are here, you're kind of going to need someone who can drop deeper to help facilitate the build-up phase now. So for balls on the right-hand side, you're going to see Mount dropping deeper here to help create those passing triangles to keep the ball going. A lot of times you'll see Kai Havertzen drift into that side too to, of course, maintain those overloads as well. And you'll see the same thing on the left-hand side with Matteo Kovacic. And, you know, I was kind of getting like a lot of like Maurizio Sarri vibes where a lot of times you see those diagonal runs from cover being made wide of course to help like allow guys to push further forward as well too so that was like the workaround to using a very wide build-up structure now i don't think we'll play like this every single time you know port is going to adapt the system and tweak things depending on the opposition as you're noticing uh zarsberg were using like a diamond two up front type of system so you can see why we played like this always have the options to play through their press and of course, uh, you know, create attacks against them. Now, one player in particular was Mark Kukurea, who I think is going to be a pretty important player for Graham Potter. A lot of times he had the license really to, uh, you know, really push forward and advance up the field, which was really key and was really needed in the attack. And he did that with regularity throughout the entirety of the game. He was very positive, very direct. And a lot of times he was going right up to the byline as well too so I, I can understand why Porter kind of transitioned him to being like a wide centre-back for them for Brighton last season because not only is he very aggressive 
in terms of how tight and close he gets. It's a bit Aspie-ish at times. I mean, against Sechko, for example, Sechko kind of struggled against Kukurea quite a lot of times because Kuku just wasn't allowing this guy to turn or spin him or do anything. And on top of that, he has that type of explosion, that pace, of course, uh, play in both halves and, you know, help defend against the counterattacks as well too. So because of this, you can kind of see how things kind of make shift a little bit now in terms of how the structures are. If Kukurela's pushing forward on the ball, that's in the triggers for your Mateo Kovacic and your Raheem Sterling to help free up space and create that 1v1 space for Raheem Sterling, which was key throughout the entire of the game. So Kovacic's making that diagonal run, uh, you know, taking out the midfield player here. Sterling's waiting for the overlapping run from Kukurea over here, which is going to take the attention of Dedic. You've seen Havertz is moving here to occupy Bernardo, but not um, Aubameyang's by Pavlovic. And that's how Raheem Sterling then has those types of spaces. And with someone like a Raheem as well too, you know, he had that type of license where, okay, do I want to go to the byline? Do I want to come back in sides? You know, do I want to just go and go for myself and, you know, create spaces to take shots? Uh, he was unmarked throughout the entirety of the game. And it's interesting that he's taken up the wing back role and position. It does make a lot more sense. I prefer my attacking guys to be receiving out wide because, you know, they're, I feel a lot more confident about their goal threat compared to having like standard wing backs, no matter how good like your Ben Chirils are, etc, etc. But normally if Kukurea is like really pushing up the field as well, let me just have him back here. Let me just use the line instead to show you guys where he's supposed to be. And that would mean then Reese James would have to keep the balance on the opposite side. Of course, he can't just be bombing forward all the way here because if he's doing that, then it means that we're very susceptible to the counter-attack, which we were on a handful of occasions. And you're hoping that over time, we are gonna improve, but on, you know, how we look to uh, mitigate them. And hopefully I think the best way of mitigating team counter-attacks is by scoring more goals for yourself, actually. So uh, yeah, that's kind of like some of uh, an introduction behind what the thinking is in terms of like the build-up phase and the attack. But for me, most importantly, what I really liked you guys was like the, uh, the occupation inside the books. You know, for example, let me move a Bemiyank here. Let me move Kavert, uh, Kavertz. <laughs> Havertz over here as well too. Let me push Mount a bit higher up as well. Uh, just imagine, just imagine that RB Salzburg are just, actually, why imagine that? Let me just pretend these guys are defending in a block right now to try and like mitigate what we're doing, etc, etc. That's like the best context to show things. I liked that we did have, you know, like good occupation inside the books, you know, at times under Thomas Tuchel, you know, I did kind of feel like that was one of the main things that we did lack at times. I did feel like you'd only see like one of the uh, the forwards only. Like let's pretend this is a Lukaku. He'd be in the books by himself with no one to link up with. How's that gonna help you create goals? You know, under Graham Porter though, he wants to have regular presence in these areas. That's going to bring more fear to the opponent. So let's hope now that when these guys are able to build a better team understanding together, build better connections, relationships, the key things needed in the field, and it's not just tactics, 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 tactics only, then I think we will be a much more creative and uh, a, a lot more threatening when we're attacking. Now, before I move on to end things, I do want to talk about a few things from the game. And I think in particular, I want to talk about Kai Havertz. Um, you know, in my review, maybe I got things a little bit wrong. Uh, I said that he was a, a number 10. I normally like with number 10s, like, we know what number 10s are. You know, they're the creative guys in the team. They're the fantasy guys. They're the ones looking to play these passes in behind. Uh, they're the players that are, you know, the, uh, the the ones you rely upon to turn things around for you. But uh, I don't necessarily feel that Porter was kind of used them in that traditional sense at all. I think he was just using him a bit deeper to play off of like an Obemiang, for example. And, you know, like with this type of series I'm trying to do, I'm trying to just use like uh, this tactics, uh, like um, software I'm using to explain like, you know, observations, thoughts, ideas, tactics, theories that I'm seeing in the game. I think it's like a much easier way to visualize that. And I'll, I'll, I'll improve as I get used to using it more and more and more. And more but um of course focusing on Kai Havertz I want to give you guys a bit of uh, context behind my thinkings and stuff you know he had these areas here so for example we moved to the like right moved to the left and in that sense he was presenting himself as like that third man option depending on wherever the ball was so if the ball was being played of course down the like 
I don't know. So if the ball was being played down at the right hand side, for example, let's say like your Reese James's and Mount who are linked up really well throughout the entirety of the game as well too were here. Then Kai Havertz would move and present himself here as well to help just maintain and facilitate those overloads. Uh, a lot of times we were seeing Mount stretching the run there to make Reese James free for a cross and vice versa as well too, for example. And, um, you know, it's not necessarily about Kai being in these areas to do like a De Bruyne to then find a Bemyang by himself through like a, an unreal cross or something like that. That wasn't the play. It's just to help facilitate those overloads uh, wide. But I do think that by reverting Kai deeper, I actually do like this more. And I think there is more life to come from Havertz playing this way. I feel like under Tuchel before, yeah, we used to see this guy playing up front as a striker a lot of times. And, you know, he's having to like uh, play back to goal against a strong physical defender. And, you know, it's not necessarily the best way to use him, in my opinion. Uh, a lot of times he was going for aerials. Uh, last season, the amount of goals he scored from headers was mad. But by moving this guy off away from defenders, I think this is where Kai can slowly rediscover what he's really good at. Like for me, I really like this guy's thinking and movement behind. I think that's what he's really good. And when you have something like an Aubameyang here that can stretch defenders and occupy them as well too, Havertz is very intelligent enough to know when he can like, you know, find the right type of spaces to make those late arrivals in. So he'll move here, he'll move there, for example. And as I was saying before, if he had to facilitate the build-up play, he moves to the right and he moves to the left. And I think that's how you have to use Kai. Um, in particular too, by playing centrally, he did have like options to link up with from like your mounts and your cover chitches. So if there was an opportunity to play one twos or quick layoff passes, etc, etc, his execution wasn't perfect. Let's get that right. I'm not here to be defending Havertz for the performance. I'm here to talk about, you know, the use of him and what you can do and, and, and more that can come from him. And uh, hopefully that improves as the season does go on. But I do like the idea of him not being marked by his man, by him having that license and freedom to at least be a bit more involved in the build-up, to be a bit more uh, involved in the attack and to use his best traits, which is that timing of his run, you know, uh, using that intelligence to know what type of spaces to occupy and when to make those moves in. And I hope that when these guys over time can build more understanding with each other, which hasn't really been a thing in the, due to the last management, because I think Tuchel was just very much centered on like those automatisms of, okay, when the ball's here, you're here, you're there, you know, those same passing patterns you were seeing of like, let's say like, uh, <laughs> Uh, like Havertz was up front, you'd see Mount was like on the right, you'd see like who else? It would be it would be Timo, it would be Pulisic, it would be Zia, it could be anyone playing on the left there as well too. Plus to try and like find the wing back three every single time. I, I just think after a while, I really got like played out, got found out in the end. I mean, we we're devoid of many uh, ideas in the final third. So I do think that too, Graham has found like a very... Um, uh, like a nice interpretation of Kai that I, I think could work out as the season does go on. Now, before I fully, fully go, I, I guess a few more takeaways. Uh, let me actually focus on um, Mateo Kovacic for a second. Uh, I'm going to be very lenient on Mateo, just like uh, N'Golo can say, boy, these guys have really been suffering with the injuries after injuries after injuries. And for me, uh, similar to Kante, I haven't seen Pete Kovacic for uh, probably since January after that like incredible goal versus Liverpool with a volley. And now that he could be used more as a box to box midfield player, I think it's going to be quite interesting because I think now he has more license to like, you know, break forward a lot more, etc, etc. I think maybe this is where it doesn't always suit Kovacic because I don't think he is as threatening when he's close to goal compared to when he's in these areas right here, when he's like really facilitating the build-up phase and he's using like his incredible like dribbling skills, of course, to be able to, you know, help progress the team up the field and, and break the lines, etc., etc. I think that, you know, I understand he's not fully fit, so I'm going to be a bit more lenient to see how he interprets things. But I remember his time on Dasari playing as a box-to-box -box mid. 
he did kind of suffer there in the end and after a while it was only natural that second half of that season. Ruben loftus cleek took that position from him and we kind of elevated as a team having a more naturally suited uh, uh, number eight that is very comfortable, you know, carrying the ball forwards and was really good playing uh, in the final thirds. So I want to see how Kovacic copes playing in this type of new role because, you know, yesterday he always has one or two nice things, but yeah, it was uh, quite a few turnovers. And I thought it's like defensive presence as well too and helping like, um, let me just try it here. And helping like, um, you know, give protection to the left-hand side, especially if like Kukurea is going to, you know, for the system, has to push forward as well too to allow Sterling, of course, to have an option close to him. You know, it is going to require like a lot of like discipline and a lot of, um, you know, running and uh, from Kovacic. So let's hope that his stamina as the season goes on can step up can improve because it is going to be crucial and key that he can help kind of defend these zones and areas especially off the board as well too and you know last night's game i'd probably say he was the weakest I mean, full player uh, by quite a distance actually so as i said let's hope he can turn things around but playing box to box i need to see if he can interpret it or if i'm going to see the same Mateo Kovacic that i saw you know all those seasons back and one more thing before i go Graham Potter, <laughs> I know you brought on Loftus Cleek to replace Havertz in that role, but I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Ruben isn't the, um, he's not a cam like that, you know. Like, as I was saying before, if Kai was moving and, and constantly looking to help create those overloads and be the fat man option, Ruben was just way too stack, you know, waiting for the ball to receive to his feet all the time, yeah. A few times we saw like runs out wide on the right hand side in particular, but he nearly won us a penalty in this area over here versus Pavlovich. But other than that, to be honest with you, you know, it's not, uh, not as threatening. And actually for me, I think he'd be a lot more effective playing deeper in the Kovacic role here, for example, playing that box safe role because he really improved his defensive work even more under Thomas Tuchel. And I think you give Ruben that license here with his power, that ability to break the lines, get forward. And of course, um, the dribbling skills, the space that creates and his presence in the final third. I think we could see a Ruben off this league that hopefully could be reclaiming some of those, uh, you know, uh, 17, 18 season vibes. So there you guys have it, man. There's some of like, my impressions and thoughts and opinions after that game. Be brutally honest with me in the comment section. Uh, I want to kind of do something like this after like quite a few games this season. Uh, I'm going to improve the format. Hopefully you guys understand where I'm coming from. You get my explanations, etc., etc. If you don't, let me know because I want to improve stuff for the viewer. That's what my job is Yeah, It's not about my ego or satisfying anything about me. It's all about you in this one. So give me some proper honest feedback on that. But on that note, I'm going to wrap things up, keep things moving. Thank you for watching. I'm Nini FC, this is Blue Line CV. Catch you guys there with some more videos. Cool.